Today is the 18th anniversary of the death of Rick DeVecchi. On this date, back in 1998, he was hit and killed by a driver of a Cadillac in the city of Berkeley. That driver was never caught. And joining us this morning is Rick's brother, Randy DeVecchi. He's a photographer here at KTVU to talk more about what happened and where this case is so many years later. Good morning. Good morning. Thank good, you good to have you in, Randy. Uh, well, let's talk about your brother first. Uh, he was 37 when it happened, so he'd be in his mid-50s now, right? That is correct, yes. Yeah, tell us about him. What was he like? Uh, it sounds so cliche, but he really was a good person. Yeah. Uh, he made uh, changes in the world, but through his own actions that were not publicized. They weren't, you know, fanfare, banging his chest, showing everybody, look at what I did. He really did things on his own by himself. He helped people without being asked. He was just a, he was a genuine person. And I imagine it's been tough not having closure 18 years strong. Well, that's, that's the biggest thing. It's been 18 years, and peace and closure is literally all that we're looking for. And the big question is why. Why? Why did this happen? You know, why did this guy decide to do this? Why did the guy hit, take the car and hit my brother? Well, let's talk about that. Uh, <coughs> trucking business in Berkeley, mm -hmm. early in the morning, he saw someone prowling around a car, went out to just take a look, and what happened? Basically what happened was there was a lot of petty thefts that used to happen in the area mm -hmm. and uh, we assume that the person that did this happened to be the same person because the petty thefts stopped. pretty much stopped. Uh, but what happened was there was somebody in the back of his pickup truck and he went across the street to go see what was going on and by that time the person had gotten into his own car and was driving at a low rate of speed but something made this guy just hit the accelerator and swerve halfway across the street, hit him, and then swerve back. So that's why everybody knows it was intentional. It was deliberate. It, it was, was deliberate. A, yeah. Now, your brother survived for a few days, right? Three, three days in the hospital? Yeah. Was he, he, was he able to communicate with police not at, at all. all? Not at all. Not at all. Uh, he was in ICU, uh, attached to everything, and, and uh, basically they were just looking for the swelling of the brain to come down, and it didn't. It kept going. Further and further. But there is a description out of uh, whoever may have done this, right? There is. Uh, it, a couple of years after the fact, we actually had a person that would see visions. He was the one who witnessed that, what happened. He see these little visions. And uh, uh, one of the police officers from San Jose Police Department was able to do a repressed memory sketch. And uh, when the sketch was done, it actually looked like a person. Mm -hmm. And that's the sketch that people are looking at to try to find out who this person was. Um, any leads at all, 18 years later? I know it's a cold case, and uh, you, you guys need closure. Yeah, um, not that I know of. Uh, I know BPD is looking for anybody that has any information to give them a lead to look at. But like I said, 18 years later, it's, it's really difficult because the investigators that work on the case originally, they've either retired, moved on, passed away. So it's kind of just gets passed down and down, you know, until whoever's working the case is kind of looking at it with fresh eyes. And that could be a good thing because sometimes fresh eyes can find something that somebody else didn't see. And that happens. It does happen. And yeah. that's, that's kind of the hope. I mean, we have hope that somebody's going to come forward at some point. Uh, not really hopeful that somebody's going to have this weighing on them and they're going to finally come out and give a confession. Right. But, um, but you never know. Yeah, but, but, never know. but we're hoping that, the, you know, that somebody says something. And we can't believe that this is the smartest crook in the world and never said anything to anybody. Yeah, and your brother lives on because he was an <clears throat> organ donor, right? Yes. Yeah, um, and that's why we have to live with the fact that he was buried on Christmas Eve. So we always spend our Christmas Eves at the cemetery, and that's because... First it became, you know, the hit and run, then it became a homicide, then it became a don donor, and by the time all that was done, then it was Christmas Eve when we, when we did the burial. But, uh, yeah, we, we've contacted the donor network before, and uh, we did find out that, you know, his heart was given away and his lungs and his, you know, all these different... So there's, there's a, about six other people that Some are living... Some goodness out there. Six other people living Thanks today because brother. of him, yeah. Yeah, well, it's awfully tough, and he had two stepkids. How are they doing? How's the family? I think the family does the best that they can. It changes your life forever, um, so we all just kind of take solace in the fact that we have each other still, but we just don't have Rick. Yeah. Well, the important thing is to keep it in the public eye, and maybe someone will step forward, and maybe they'll find a lead. We yeah, so. and, and that's, you know, fortunate that I work here, that I yeah. kind of know how the media works, and the more that it's out there, it just takes one person to see it and say, oh, yeah, I remember that. And then I need to step. They need to step forward for us. Yeah. Well, Randy, we wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thanks for, having for coming. Me.